Welcome back to the Block Fuel Podcast. Today we have Max Luck, Head of Growth at Flare Network. Max, thanks for coming by. Thanks so much for having me. Great to be here. Yeah, so you're coming in from London. I saw that we both know Toby, uh, Toby Norfolk Thompson. Oh, yeah. From T Trident Digital. Yep. Fascinating guy. Great speaker. We, uh, we were actually, I sat down and like helped them film something with Membrane Labs, who's a friend of ours uh, in Singapore. But let's just dive in straight to the London crypto scene. I think it's a nice way to break the ice. My wife is a massive fan. She used to live in London for two years and, and loved it. So she's going to want me to point that out. <laughs> and uh, yeah, enlighten us a little bit before we get into Eat Denver stuff. Nice. Yeah. Toby's a great guy. Mm -hmm. he, he, I actually met Toby around four years ago through an introduction and got to know him a little bit. Went to a dinner he was hosting in Singapore a few years back and was just, it was a really lovely welcome into the space. He, he knows so many people and I got to have so many interesting conversations with quite big movers in the space. So got, got, got my speed up to speed on the whole blockchain arena and industry. Yeah. Yeah. I think he brings like 25 years of like traditional London you know, finance to it that you expect. And mm -hmm. I think there's like always like a calm confidence in, in some of the questions that he answers of just like, this is how it's been done. We're not, you know, if we're doing institutional lending, even if it's on a blockchain, it's not that much different, which kind of gives people a nice bridge to mm -hmm. walk over and say, oh, okay, I can understand this stuff. Yeah. So what brings you to Eat Denver this week? Like, what are you talking with people? And, you know, what are your conversations with Flair? Like, how do they flare up? Right. But yeah. Also, so I'm here with a few members of the team. We have yeah. our head of events and we have our DeFi lead and our technical product lead and head of DevRel. I mean, we've been doing quite a lot of uh, work with builders. Mm -hmm. We actually held an event the other day for a builders club, which has been wonderful. Like such a great turnout. We, we were at the um, event in, in actually in Oxford before Denver and had a great kind of set of results coming out of a hackathon that focuses kind of on Flair's native tech. On, on, the, on the oracles that we'll, we'll go into a little bit later. And we've been here, kind of, we, were, we had a booth at the Multi-Chain Day, multi -chain day which yeah. was great. A lot of really interesting conversations with different, different perspective protocols, builders coming to launch on the network and existing partners too. Some on the more institutional side, some on the more kind of just DeFi infrastructure, mm -hmm. bridges. It's, it's been a great opportunity to kind of meet up with, with old and new relations. So, yeah, it's been a great, yeah. great, great one so far. Yeah, it seems like a lot of people here, I think people are excited about in the U.S., you know, regulation appears to be, you know, opening up a little bit. We were just catching up about, like, you know, Bitcoin Nashville. You mm. had the chance to to sit in and walk in on, on Trump's speech, you know, in the event. Mm -hmm. And as someone from the U.K., like, what was that experience like? I think it was just, it was incredible sensing the energy in the room. I haven't had the fortune of hearing any of our, our ministers speak in, in the UK. But yeah, it was quite it was quite an interesting experience. I hadn't been to Nashville before. Yeah. The music scene there is is really quite something. And he hearing Trump speak was 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 definitely quite curious as a precursor to when he sort of came in and, and some of the things he was talking about with regards to, you know, treasury assets mm -hmm. with regards to Bitcoin uh, and some of kind of the observations he was making about the space were were interesting to hear. I'd I'd be very curious if, if the UK government ever kind of acknowledged any of that <laughs> <laughs> digital assets and such. Yeah, be great. It, it gets up and does, you know, like you need a prime minister, maybe you do or don't need a prime minister that does a huge stump speech, you know, like that, where it's, it's just, you know, exactly what you expect from Trump to say, right? There's mm. nothing new from him. So Max, like, talk to us a little bit about and like help educate us on where does Flair you know, sit in the ecosystem? How can we like kind of break down to our audience that's not familiar where you guys, you know, support other chains as a data chain? You support, you know, different blockchain technologies that, you know, may not be able to do everything smart contract based. Mm -hmm. You know, things are more complex than they seem on the surface. So like, talk us a, a little bit about like where you guys fit in. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, it's been quite, a, it's been quite the journey so far. So Flash started out with the intention of becoming the DeFi hub for non-smart contract chain tokens, offering utility Web3 functionality like virtual machine functionality with smart contracts for non-smart contract chain tokens like, like Bitcoin, like XRP, like Dogecoin. And what we've been working on over the past four or five years has been putting together a really strong, robust, decentralized infrastructure to support that functionality. So Flare is a layer one EVM blockchain. 
similar to the likes of Ethereum. The unique thing about Flare's positioning in the space is that the, the builders that would use the network can rely on Flare's own data feeds. We have oracles for price and state data mm -hmm. that are enshrined at the network layer. And what that means is that the role of, of bringing data from off-chain on-chain is actually built into the network itself. So the, the validator set that you know, validate the blocks on Flare are also the data providers and attestation providers for price feeds and for other blockchain data, Web3 data, plus internet API data. Mm -hmm. So as a developer coming to build on the network, you can get access to data without relying on third-party oracles, safe in the knowledge that the data will be high integrity and the oracles themselves inherit the economic security of the entire blockchain. And as a positioning kind of within the space, we serve as, a, as this DeFi hub that I was mentioning for non-smart contract chain tokens, but also a data hub. And we're aiming to be a full stack solution for developers to be able to come and just build the application on the network. Yeah. Inter interoperability first, but reliable data, decentralization. Yeah. So if we put this in terms of you know, especially, you know, as we started talking about, you know, the election and politics a little bit is, you know, in Polygon, you have Polymarket, which mm -hmm. was, you know, a big consumer app yeah. breakthrough that like, oh, hey, like most people can understand stable coins. It's mm -hmm. not like a big part of like the experience, but it works and there's interest and there's volume. Yeah. And running back your description of Flare, if someone wanted to build a Polymarket on, on Bitcoin, on XRP, you know, or Ripple, then you guys would be able to provide that functionality where it's like, hey, here's all the data feeds that could come in, like your, your app. And there's going to be other, other tools involved, but you guys could help build out what you can't do directly on Bitcoin itself. Exactly, yeah. So Bitcoin, it would be possible to use the asset Bitcoin as input collateral for the system. You would also be able to facilitate smart contract-based actions on Flare depending upon assets moving around on the Bitcoin chain. So you can kind of reach a level of chain abstraction to some extent with Flare because you can prove events taking place on external chains using our oracles. So yeah, you could use Bitcoin as an input currency to open a kind of a prediction market position on a, on a poly market on Flare, or you could also open a perpetual position if you wished. Yeah. And from your job in the you know, head of ecosystem, head of growth, and you're looking at people building on Flare, is this where you, you're approaching, you know, some of these existing communities and you're, you're trying to build bridges, you're trying to like offer them up some, hey, here's some use cases, you know, do you have these problems? Specifically like Bitcoin community or Ripple community, both communities that can be very tribalistic. Like <laughs> I think, you know, we'll, we'll talk to a few and they don't like, you know, always get along with each other. But in this you know, regard, you're someone that extends a hand and says, hey, like here's some functionality we can enable. Yeah, I think so the thing... The thing I always come back to with Flare is that when our founders read the, the Bitcoin white paper and, and were kind of going through things like the Nakamoto coefficient and, and understanding the kind of the, the premise of on, you know, the goals, the intentions that Bitcoin was set up, built, architected to solve, really we maintained that we were going to try and get as close to that and offer that utility to these external chains that maybe don't have that functionality built in. That's where Flare really thrives. And I think for builders coming and building on Flare that may be from those communities, we can say, look, you can use your assets as input currencies for, for the DeFi ecosystem. You can gain yield on, on those assets in a way that still adheres to the principles from those base chains. Our intention really is to maintain that decentralized infrastructure. We, re we, we adhere to those principles strongly. And, and that's the core kind of guiding light for Flare is to be able to offer this functionality to builders who maybe can't achieve those things on those chains. Mm -hmm. And so you guys are doing a, is it a hackathon in Berkeley coming up? Yeah. In partnership with Google. Yes. We just talked about one of our early guests was Rich Whitman, you know, oh, yeah. head, head of Google Cloud's Web3 program. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about the hackathon. So the hackathon is taking place, I think from the 7th of March until the 9th of March. It's going to be in Berkeley. We partnered with the University of Waterloo. Obviously, Google Cloud is going to be present too, which is very exciting for us. The, the, the main focus of the, of the event is going to be 
agentic AI and establishing verifiable AI within Google's TE infrastructure, which is called confidential space. And we're main, mainly aiming to basically have tracks that enable these builders to create interesting builds that make use of that infrastructure with regards to the LLM kind of technology that's proliferating at the moment. Yeah, and we won't dive too deep into the TEEs, but trusted execution environments and in a nutshell, like, correct me if I'm wrong, because you, you certainly know it better than I do, but basically providing safe ways for these new AI agents to interact with data, to perform functions without having access to everything. You know, it's just like, hey, you can perform this function and access the data in a way that's secure and less ability to get back. Yeah, it's kind of an extension of computation within secure enclaves. So mm -hmm. you, can, you can really maintain that, that privacy element within the TP. And, and sort of one of the main reasons why that's interesting is that blockchain isn't really designed to be highly performant in terms of computation. If you've used some of the applications, you know, some of the early AMMs, they're amazing in their design and the, the possibilities with smart contract functionality. But reaching feature-rich applications like you'd find on the, on, the, on the App Store for Apple or on the Google Play Store isn't really what blockchain is designed for. Blockchain is really much designed for immutable, decentralized operations. So having a, a kind of an infrastructure of trusted execution environments as an extension to compute, to enable more feature-rich applications to run is, is the main goal. And with Agentic AI, you're probably familiar with some of the LLMs that run within these TEs or can be run within these TEs. That's kind of the main focus that we're kind of working on to, to enable. Yeah. Yeah. And Agentic AI is very much in, in vogue at this Gosh. stage. <laughs> Every conversation now. We didn't expect it. Should have researched more. But... I, th I think it's it's also good to be thinking about these things of where you see specifically you know a lot of good use cases for mm -hmm. agentic AI, but do you want to give your AI agent a credit card and just handle every internet task? Like no, like I don't feel comfortable always like even giving Google Chrome my like credit card to store mm -hmm. and and spend. So I think there's there's a lot of these things to be thinking through of like hey like. This can do all your tasks for you. This can, you know, book your entire trip to Europe. But you're also at the side of, in the mercy of, you need to be able to have an AI that you can trust or that can't be hacked. I think coming off the Bybit hack, even the biggest, you know, exchanges, you know, are, are vulnerable. So mm. it's good to be talking about these things early, being very cautious of, like, how much power we give them. Mm, yeah, 100%. And I think that's where the intersection of blockchain and AI is particularly interesting because through the smart contracts of blockchains, you can actually effectively set the guardrails for the operation of the AI, of the LLMs running with TEs. So I think it's, it's an area that obviously requires a lot of work. There's going to be a lot of exploration. There's mm -hmm. going to be huge amounts of funding that go into the space. And I'm excited to see kind of the builds that come out of, of the Google Hackathon. Yeah. And I'm also very interested, you know, the next phase where, where ultimately what we're aiming to get to is enable this verifiable off-chain compute through a set of enshrined trusted execution environments, because ultimately Flare's infrastructure with its native oracles and enshrined oracles offers that possibility in the future yeah. using that kind of unique architecture. So I'm keen to kind of see what the results are like with that whilst we're building out all of the functionality in terms of the DeFi hub for these non-smart contract chains. Yeah. So what's the best way to, to follow Flare? Is you guys go into the hackathon? Are you guys going to be posting anything from it or like some of these top projects? Like how can we like kind of circle back on this and see what happens? Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, following Flare, I think it's Flare Networks on X. Mm -hmm. Flare.network, the website will provide all of the uh, information that anyone would require, plus all of, all of the links to various social media. We do update socials every day, our head of marketing and social content managers are amazing at that. I think they really help to communicate the essence of what we're doing in a way that can be understood by a broader audience. And it's definitely something that I think in the blockchain space, a lot of companies are, are, are wrestling with to some extent because these things are complicated. And if you were to turn around back in 1995 and say, 
hey, listen, so there's going to be this protocol for mail that's going to be sent over the internet protocol. It's going to be various different things with, with regards to privacy that are going to be upcoming. You know, don't don't give away your password if anyone asks for your password. There's huge amounts of basically educational work that's yet to be done. But I'm hoping that at least from the flair side of things, we're we're already well along that journey of educating our community, welcoming newcomers to the space. Yeah, absolutely. And and part of this is one thing that we definitely want to push and help educate on is. You know, the next generation of people that are in college that are saying, hey, like, is AI going to replace software engineering? Is like, can you use Replit to go build something or ChatGPT to go build something in Python? You know, just a, a few, like, really d distinct prompts. And to be out there, like, doing hackathons, to, you know, at a college, you know, in Berkeley, that allows, like, at least some of these, you know, you know current college students, future college students, just to see, hey, like, come build on us. Here's what we're doing. If you have an AI agent idea, Mm -hmm. And like, come talk to us. And and I think that's what's like exciting is that you're actually like trying to set up the next generation to handle this hurdle and this like shift to like a new world of programming. Well, that's it. And I think what we're seeing is the incredible pace of release of tooling. Yeah, it's it's hard to beat the creativity, the originality of human beings at this moment in time. But what human beings can do is leverage this incredible resource of technology that continues to proliferate, improve, become more efficient, and they can use those resources. And I think that's what we're aiming to really do with the Flare AI kit at this Google Hackathon that we're doing. It's, it's, it's start to enable people to build these agents that make use of Flare's ecosystem, that make journeys easier for the end users, and, and really gather some utility. Yeah. Well, Max, we'll have to circle back on this. We want to hear some cool stuff coming out of the hackathon. And yeah, really appreciate you stopping by in Denver. It's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. Thank you, Max.